G'day mate, 40 here. So one of the things that makes La Brea Tarpid so awesome is that there are no homeless here, right? No drug dealers, right? No panhandlers. They're just good people. Salt of the earth people. So why can't all of LA be like this? And keep your dogs leashed and uh, keep your homeless leashed right so one challenge to effective homelessness policies is uh, this notion pushed by the ACLU and others that uh, the homeless have a right to just live on the streets but uh, do they really I mean many of them are crazy homeless, uh, crazy often, drug addicts out of their minds on drugs and alcohol. And so let's be all libertarian about it and the non-aggression principle. Like a bunch of homeless dudes like right here, if they were just lying there in the bushes, that would be aggressive against you know, my feeling of ease and calm. Because when people are sufficiently violating you know, the norms of public behavior, such as by you know peeing and defecating in the bushes here, then uh, that's an aggression against me, against the fine citizens of California. So, you know, someone jacking off in the bushes—that's an aggression against my sense of decency and peace and calm. I don't want to encounter a man jacking off in the bushes. Like I just want to be free to commune with God and my fellow Los Angelinos here in the beauty of this great city. And so I'm quite willing to do away with the homeless's civil rights to live on the streets and to defecate on the streets. I was reading Kevin Starr's book on California. I think it came out in 2003. And he predicted in it that California would, by 2020, have a population of 50 million. Not true, right? We're still at 40 million. Right? California's population basically hasn't changed in 20 years. And I'm A-OK -okay with that. So we have about half of the nation's homeless. No, I swear. No, it doesn't like that. How do we reduce the number of homeless in California? Right, without incentivizing other homeless people to move here. So a lot of locations like Culver City, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, that very few homeless. Why do they have very few homeless? Because they're discouraged from hanging out. And it's not, you don't find homeless in rural California counties. I think there are about 58 counties in California. Most of the counties are rural and you don't find homelessness in Lassen County or Yellow County or the more rural aspects, the homeless overwhelmingly congregate in Los Angeles, San Francisco Bay Area, and a few in Sacramento. So places like Reno, right, they'd give the homeless a hundred dollars and a bus trip to San Francisco just to get rid of them. So I don't want to build affordable housing. California right you have to be have to pay fair dinkum prices for fair dinkum housing or move to a state where there's cheaper housing like, I don't want to incentivize being a loser I want to incentivize being a productive tax-paying citizen so to protect civilization to protect California I think we first of all have to protect the taxpayers look out for their interests and we have to start cracking down on antisocial behavior you know, anything like the squeegee man that they used to have in New York City right? we have to crack down on that we have to return to the crime of vagancy we have to build more prisons 
prosecute people or lock them up for a long time. So, antisocial behavior is an aggression on me, uh, the upright citizen. So, I'd like to see a government that incentivizes pro social behavior, which is paying for you know, people who work hard and pay their taxes and create incentives against going on welfare and disability and being homeless and drug addict and vagrant. So, yeah, I'd like to return to the days where we institutionalize people who are acting mad. To restart restocking our institutions. We should be able to have clean, well-lighted social places like this. And there's no antisocial behavior here. Perfectly clean restrooms. There's water to drink for free. There are lavish museums. There's this good, healthy Sunday afternoon in Los Angeles behavior. And I think that uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, has done a pretty good job. I can give him a C or a B. So the roads generally work. Most of the work stuff that he does isn't particularly important. He's, I think he's proven himself to be a competent governor. And uh, LA's last mayor, Eric Garcetti, has been competent. And uh, Karen Bass, right, she's a big lefty, but she seems to be competent. Just have to disincentivize the homeless of the country coming to congregate in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Create more beautiful spaces like these lights at night, they light up and couples love to come here and take photos. He certainly got his troubles, but I've been out and about for seven miles of hiking through Beverly Hills, here into Park La Brea, to Hancock Park, Fairfax Park, and uh, it's been pretty dug on nice. wish we could find ways to expand this beautiful space. Fine, let's Disneyfy it. Like I think New York City is a, a lot better when it became more Disneyfied. 42nd Street became more Disneyfied. So you say, oh, you don't want it to become Disneyfied. You don't want it to become woke and gay. Well, I'd much rather have it become working gay and safe and clean like this than lawless like Somalia. What a lovely place to spend a Sunday afternoon. No trash. No homeless. No crime. No feeling of menace great place to bring your family, your children. I've got to uh, create safety. They have to be pretty rigorous against the antisocial and the criminally inclined. So I have to create space for tender, vulnerable, sensitive, kind, caring people, having friendly interactions. They have to be pretty rigorous about taking out the trash. Once you take out the trash, then you can create space for love to thrive. Then what do you do with the trash? Well, 
you hire people with expertise in either rehabilitating them or providing them with proper care but you don't, don't want to incentivize normal people to become losers so that's why I'm strongly opposed to the legalization of marijuana right probably more than any other one thing I notice it tends to make normal people into losers so I think it stinks that you walk around LA and constantly getting a good whiff of marijuana it's a gateway drug guys stay off the track look at this magnificent Peterson Automotive Museum just fantastic doesn't that make you happy? I used to work in that building. I was uh, a temp at Details Magazine. I remember walking into the editor's office and asking him where I could, where I could send my book, 100 Years of Sex and Film, to get a review. <laughs> I think he was particularly impressed. I remember I worked as a temp at William Morris Talent Agency. I worked for Ben Silverman. And I remember I was on the phone a lot. One of the agents I was working for I said, what are you doing? You're writing a book? I said, yes, I am. I was like calling retired FBI agents to get the lowdown on how they dealt with the sex industry. Still the land of opportunity. Isn't this lovely? We got the best museums, don't we, folks? And just up the street here, we got Shell Havert High School, one Orthodox school. I think, along with Shiva University, of Los Angeles, another modern Orthodox day school. The yearly tuition is about thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year, without discounts. And if you want discounts, you have to submit your tax returns, all sorts of documentation. So probably half or more of the students get some kind of discount. But on the positive side, one thing that parents can do that will affect their children, you can have a tremendous influence on who is their peer group. So you send them to Shell Habit, Yeshiva University, Los Angeles, they have friends there and they're, they're happy there. You kind of created a peer group and a bubble for them you know, against all the decadence and filth. And uh, all their friends will be Orthodox Jews. And now they may not stay Orthodox, right? But at least they'll have a clean, clean, well lighted upbringing. So that's the big reason a lot of. Uh, Jews stay Orthodox and become Orthodox to create a safe, clean, sheltered from the paws and the filth upbringing for their kids. And so most Orthodox Jews are still virgins when they get married. And they live in Beverly Hills and West LA and Manhattan. Very, very affluent urban environments. And yet, they grow up largely free of the paws. Not completely free, they still get affected by it. And they still watch TV and surf the internet. But you have to shelter your kids basically until they get married. You have to go out into the world and work. By the way, that... Right, and so you have to provide them that sort of shelter and innocence and cleanliness of the soul. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So Jerry Friedman is in charge of this school and donated, I think, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to creating Shell Heaven, which is the, the mo most modern Orthodox day school here in Los Angeles. Now, 
how the schools really struggled during COVID, right? Because the parents said, why are we paying the equivalent of $30,000 a year for them to get education via Zoom? And because they were private schools, they went back to meeting in person a lot quicker than the public schools. So public schools was largely shut down for two years. But the private schools and the synagogues, right? They were back to meeting in person within three months. So I think that was a lot healthier for the parents, for the kids. Come on, get off the street. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, Julie Hartman, Dennis Prager's YouTube co-host, talked about uh, an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. She was amazed at uh, Harvard students that were such cheap in just going along with the COVID restrictions. And so Harvard students have worked very hard to get to where they're at, and they've learned to play the game, and part of the playing game is that you recognize and follow along with authority. So your, your average American who didn't go to college a lot more rebellious against COVID restrictions than your more well-educated Americans. Now, I'm not taking a position either way about who was right. I guess I, I think overall that uh, that many of the COVID restrictions were good and that our public health officials did the best they could. Now, one thing I think a lot of people get wrong with COVID health restrictions and public health and approach. A diplomat, that is a terrific show. The Kerry Russell, The Diplomat. I mean, that's a hilarious show on, on Netflix. But uh, one thing that uh, critics of uh, COVID restrictions tend to get wrong, I think, is that uh, they have to dumb down you know, the public health message so that people with 90 and 80 IQs can get it. And so that's why I'm not offended. People like Gavin Newsom you know, breaking the rules. These higher IQ people, they're able to understand and apply many of the nuances of slowing the spread of COVID. And of course, you know, the more nuanced behavior of high IQ people, it's, it's not going to follow exactly the public health measures that were instituted to try to curtail the possibly dangerous antisocial behaviors of the 90 IQ and 100 IQ crowd. So yeah, a lot of the public health measures look really stupid to 115, 130 IQ crowd and above. But you can't give different public health messages to the 80 IQ, 90 IQ, 100 IQ, 115 and 130 IQ crowd. Right, you gotta 